Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 1. 1917. Chapter 5. Agony. May June, 1917. The Peasants' Conference has opened with about 1,000 representatives of real peasants and loyal soldiers from the front. As far as it is possible to judge, the peasants' frame of mind is incomparably more sane and balanced than that of the workmen or of the city soldiery. Patriotism, a real desire to suppress disorders, and even a willingness to abstain from taking the land until a definite settlement of this question has been reached, perfect readiness to support the government and to oppose the Bolsheviki, all these sentiments were heartily expressed by the conference. An interesting episode was the appearance at the conference of Lenin. Mounting the platform he dramatically threw off his overcoat and began to speak. This man's face reminds me of those of congenital criminals in the albums of Lombroso, and at the same time it has something in it which recalls religious fanatics of the Starover, Old Orthodox Church. He is a dull speaker and his efforts to arouse enthusiasm for Bolshevism fell absolutely flat. His speech was received coldly, his personality excited animosity, and in the end he retired in evident embarrassment. The Bolshevist Pravda, and other internationalist newspapers renewed their attack on the Peasants' Conference, calling it a citadel of the social patriots and the little bourgeois. Well, let them attack it. At least, we may be sure that for some time the mental balance of these representatives will remain secure. The Peasants' Conference adjourned after voting to organize a special peasant Soviet, electing deputies, an executive committee, and representatives of its organization in different institutions. I was elected a member of the executive committee and a delegate to the Commission for Elaboration of the Law for Election of Members of the Constitutional Assembly. On my way downtown I passed the Villa Kshasinsky which was seized by the Bolsheviki and is being used by them as a headquarters. Day after day they deliver orations from the balcony of the palace to crowds of workmen and soldiers. All efforts of the government to expel the intruders from this place have failed. The Dernovo Palace, taken by the anarchists, as well as other villas illegally held by criminals calling themselves anarchists or communists, are still in their possession. In vain the courts have ordered the intruders to vacate, and equally in vain the Minister of Justice has issued his orders. No results. Either the government has no forces at its disposal or it is afraid to act in the matter. I stopped before the Kshasinsky Palace to listen to Lenin. Although a poor speaker and a repellent personality it seems to me that this man may go far. Why? Because he is ready and determined to encourage all the violence, the criminality, and obscenity which the mob, under these demoralized conditions, is straining to let loose. Comrade workers. Thus went Lenin's speech. Take the factories from your exploiters. Comrade peasants, take the lands from your enemies, the landlords. Comrade soldiers, stop the war, go home. Make peace with the Germans and declare war on the rich. Poor wretches, you are starving while all around you are plutocrats and bankers. Why do you not seize all this wealth? Steal what has been stolen. Pitilessly destroy this whole capitalistic society. Down with it. Down with the government. Down with all war. Long life to the social revolution. Long life to class war. Long life to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Such a speech always meets a lively response. Just now it is gospel to all criminals, idlers, robbers, parasites, and all unbalanced minds. Well does Lenin know that the quickest road to his goal lies in rousing the lowest beast instincts in the unthinking masses. Zinoviev followed Lenin. What a disgusting creature this Zinoviev. In his high womanish voice, his face, his fat figure, there is something hideous and obscene, an extraordinary moral and mental degenerate. A perfect pupil has Lenin found in this man. Having listened for about an hour I crossed the Troitsky Bridge to my office. The day was beautiful. The sun shone brilliantly, and the Neva reflected a cloudless sky. But my soul was full of dark forebodings. These men, I knew, presaged very terrible things. If I were the government I would arrest them without hesitation. 
If necessary I would execute them in order to prevent the horrible catastrophe into which they plan to plunge this country. The army is rapidly becoming demoralized. Discipline and obedience have all but disappeared. Demands for peace are reiterated, and always the brutal murder of officers goes on unchecked. Poor Kerensky does his best he delivers one eloquent speech after another, but wild beasts cannot be controlled by speeches, however eloquent. In the town starvation threatens, for work has practically ceased. The Bolsheviki, with unlimited money to spend, manifest furious energy. I must say that their Pravda as a propagandist newspaper is very ably edited. Especially brilliant are the sarcastic articles of Trotsky in which he lashes and jeers his opponents, myself among them. Excellent satire. In the factories, in the parks and streets are held incessant Bolshevist meetings with their tireless slogans of, down with the bourgeois government. Down with the war. Even, down with the Soviet. We try, with more or less success, to neutralize the activities of these drunken helots, as Kerensky calls the revolutionary masses. A fair designation, though rather different from his previous one, a high-minded people who make no mistakes. Both Kerensky, Dan, Gotz, Liebherr, and other leaders in the Soviet begin to realize that we are rushing towards the abyss. From being themselves instigators of anarchy they are now veering towards moderation. The fatal weakness of all these men is that much as they fear Bolshevism they fear still more an imaginary counter-revolution. They fear to lose their reputation as revolutionists, which in these days is aristocracy. Therefore, they remain both hopeless and helpless. Many times lately I have talked with Kerensky and with Breshkovskaya. The grandmother seems in good spirits, although she is well aware of the coming catastrophe. Kerensky is plainly worried over the disorganized Soviet, the Bolsheviki, and the army. He hopes much from the next offensive which he believes will check the growing disintegration of the army. Well, there may be a chance, provided the army offensive is coincident with an offensive against anarchy behind the lines. The peasant Soviet is still a bulwark. Most of the Mujiks, representatives of the peasant majority, keep their mental balance. The left social revolutionaries, Spiridonova, Katz, Nat Hansen, and others try to demoralize them, but in vain. I regret that Spiridonova is such an extremist, for she is a sincere person, though unhappily simple-minded and credulous. In order to prevent starvation and make everyone prosperous we have only to seize all the money in the banks. She said to me. How much actual money do you think you would find in the banks? I asked her. Oh, billions in gold rubles. She exclaimed. Don't you know that the entire national income of Russia is less than 10 billion gold rubles a year? No I don't. She replied. And I don't believe it. It is nevertheless true, I assured her. If you do seize the banks, you will find stocks, bonds, papers, but very little money. The only thing you would accomplish would be the destruction of credit and economic life. Rubbish! She cried angrily. A tragic situation when the leaders understand not even the rudiments of economics. May 26, 1917, was my marriage day. It was a real revolutionary wedding. After the ceremony in the church, to which I came straight from an important meeting, my wife and our friends took only half an hour for luncheon, and then I had to hurry off to another cursed conference. Only in war or revolution could such a thing have happened. In the evening I consigned revolution to the devil and returned home to my beloved. The tornado approaches, but in spite of everything I bless this day as the happiest in my whole life. Today Professor Masaryk of Prague visited me in my office. It was a great pleasure to talk with this man, rational, intelligent, serious, and broad-minded. We discussed the Czech problem, of which I have written. Surely with such leaders as Masaryk the Czech nation will regain its independence. In the will of the people we support their cause. Work in the peasant Soviet goes on satisfactorily. The principal problems of future Russia, agrarian reform, the constitution, organization of government, defense of the country, and so on, are already tentatively arranged. 
Meetings of the Executive Committee are held daily, conferences of the Soviet three or four times a week. Local peasant Soviets are being organized all over Russia. Members have enough to do to attend meetings, visit the army at the front, participate in governmental commissions, and settle vexed questions in the provinces. Meetings of the Soviets, the workmen's and soldiers and the peasants, are conducted separately. The old Soviet at first tried to dominate, but now it has been obliged to recognize the equal status of the peasants' organization. Yet joint sessions are allowed only when very important problems are under discussion. In the hall of the Duma the members of our Soviet occupy the right side, while on the extreme left are seated the small group of Bolsheviki, the internationalists, and the left social revolutionaries. At the right of the Presidium we see Chkids, Tsaridali, Dan, Gotz, Avksintif, on the left side Trotsky, Lunacharsky, Kamenev, Nagin, and other Bolsheviki. As our men enter these reds meet us with derisive cries. Here come the little bourgeois. And we retaliate, hear the traitors. The speeches of the Bolsheviki amuse the Soviet and are generally listened to with jeers. A very grave crisis has arrived. As the executive committee of the peasant Soviet was in session, we were suddenly informed by telephone that the Bolsheviki had organized for the next morning an armed demonstration of soldiers and workmen with the demand, down with the capitalistic government. Down with the war. All the power to the Soviets. There was no doubt that such a demonstration would mean the fall of the government and the final breakdown of the offensive. It would mean bloodshed, death, civil war. At once, in cooperation with the other Soviet we determined to issue an appeal to the soldiers, workmen, and citizens to abstain from this demonstration. We warned the factories and barracks that the Bolsheviki, in calling the demonstration in the name of the Soviets, were grossly deceiving the people. As a counter to their action we voted to take part in an unarmed demonstration to take place the following week. Visiting two regiments and one factory I found the atmosphere rather pro-Bolshevist. Nevertheless, my speeches were well received. Returning home I found that my voice was entirely lost and that I was in for a sleepless night. No matter. We have thwarted the attempted armed demonstration. Next morning Pravda announced that the Bolsheviki would join in our peaceful march. This time we won, but I fear that the next victory will be theirs. The peaceful demonstration was a success, but the influence of the fanatics was everywhere apparent. At least half the banners bore their slogans, down with the capitalistic ministers. All power to the Soviets. Peace to the huts and war to the palaces. In the evening were riots and several street murders. The bloodless skirts of the revolution become more and more bloodstained. Starvation is increasing. Our offensive on the front began brilliantly, and at once the spirit of the people was immensely uplifted. Patriotic demonstrations filled all the streets and Kerensky's popularity was wildly acclaimed. The Bolsheviki, for the moment, suffered complete eclipse. Oh, if this would only last. But I cannot hope that half-disorganized army can continue victorious. I fear this splendid beginning will end in inglorious defeat. What then? The catastrophe. Nothing less. Yes, the catastrophe has come. Our revolutionary army is defeated. In mad panic it has broken, fled, and in its flight it is destroying everything in its path, murders, violations, looting, devastated fields, and destroyed villages mark its way. No discipline, no authority, no mercy for innocent women or civilians. General Kornilov and B. Savinkov demand the return of capital punishment for deserters. In vain. The impotent government and the Soviets, even in this frightful emergency, have no will to act. Again Bolshevism and anarchy prevail. Today Savinkov came to our office giving us the ghastly details of events. To imagine greater horrors is impossible. Iron discipline and ruthless punishment must be restored in the army or else Russia perishes. Declared Savinkov. But is it possible any more to find troops to enforce such measures? we asked despairingly. It is possible now. He said. But very soon it won't be. 
In this man is something of an adventurer, but in this crisis he may be useful. A significant thing has happened. At a meeting today, addressed by Grandmother Breshkovskaya, Savinkov, Plekhanov, Tchaikovsky, and myself, the audience of soldiers and workers suddenly broke out in hisses and denunciations of these oldest friends of the revolution. Against such martyrs as Breshkovskaya and Tchaikovsky were hurled epithets such as traitors, counter-revolutionaries. Springing to his feet Savinkov shouted, Who are you to treat us in this way? What have you slackers ever done for the revolution? Nothing at all. What have you ever risked? Nothing. But these men and women here, pointing to us, have lain in prison, starved, and frozen in Siberia, risked their lives over and over again. It was I and not any of you who threw a bomb at the tyrant minute. It was I and not you who for that deed heard the death penalty pronounced against me by the Tsarist government. How do you accuse us of being counter-revolutionaries? What are you anyhow but a mob of fools and loafers who are plotting the ruin of Russia, the destruction of the revolution and of yourselves? This outburst somewhat awed and impressed the mob. But it is plain that all the great revolutionaries are facing tragedy. The work and sacrifice of their lives are forgotten. In comparison with the March revolutionists they are now counted as reactionary and out of date. Have you ever thought of yourself as a reactionary counter-revolutionist? I asked the veteran Plekhanov. If these maniacs are revolutionists, then I am proud to be called a reactionary. Replied the founder of the Social Democratic Party. Have a care, Mr. Plekhanov, I said, lest you be arrested as soon as these people, your own pupils, become dictators. Since these people have become even greater reactionaries than the Tsarist government itself, what have I to expect but arrest? He asked bitterly. I like Plekhanov. It seems to me that he grasps the truth of conditions better than do his pupils in the Soviet who will not even admit him as a member. All the old revolutionaries and the founders of Russian socialism now count themselves as moderates, or in the pattern of the Bolsheviki, counter-revolutionists. I see that my conservatism is identical with what in all revolutions and social upheavals comes to be called by the mob counter-revolution. All of us are beginning to see that revolution and radicalism in practice are quite different from the same ideas in theory. The disintegration of Russia is beginning in earnest Finland, the Ukraine, and the Caucasus have declared their independence. Kronstadt, Schlüsselburg, and many small districts in various parts of Russia have voted their own independence. Even the anarchist groups barricaded in the Dernovo Villa, and the Bolsheviki in the Kshesinsky Palace have the effrontery to call themselves independent states. My poor country is breaking to pieces. Yesterday came to me some Zyrian, people of the north of Russia, proposing that our paper declare the independence of the Zyrian Republic, and offering me the presidency of the new state. Madness possesses all minds. On the impending catastrophe I published yesterday an article which I called, The Damnation of the Russian Nation. Today all the other newspapers commented on it, the Bolshevist sheets uttering threats against me. Many citizens, however, called to thank me for the article. Their sympathy cannot save the situation, which is now quite hopeless. As for me, I have no personal fears. The Social Democratic as well as the Social Revolutionary Parties have split into three branches, right, left, and center. Efforts of our Central Committee to form a coalition of the right and left social revolutionaries have utterly failed. Now all the committee can do is to act as a balance between the two wings. The same situation exists with the Social Democrats. Today, I and my colleagues were summoned to a meeting of the Central Committee and were thus admonished by Kurnoff, Zenzinov, and others. We feel that we must warn you that you are leading the will of the people in a too conservative direction. In the name of the Central Committee we demand that you make your paper less patriotic and more radical, or else that Yon resign your membership in the party. In either event your newspaper will lose our motto, through struggle we attain our rights. My dear friends, I said with a laugh, in every issue of your paper, Delo Naroda, you publish absolutely contradictory articles. In every decision you make you show the same inconsistency. Your example is not good enough for us to follow. 
The party motto we will not relinquish since we have as much right to express party opinion as you have. You may resign if you like, but you cannot force us to do so. Goodbye. Life in Petrograd becomes more and more difficult. Riots, murders, starvation, and death are everyday commonplaces. We wait the next eruption, knowing that it will surely come. Yesterday I disputed at a public meeting with Trotsky and Madame Kalante. As for this woman, it is plain that her revolutionary enthusiasm is nothing but a gratification of her sexual satiriasis. In spite of her numerous husbands, Kalante, first the wife of a general, later the mistress of a dozen men, is not yet satiated. She seeks new forms of sexual sadism. I wish she might come under the observation of Freud and other psychiatrists. She would indeed be a rare subject for them. As for Trotsky, granted favorable conditions, he will certainly rise to the top. This theatrical brigand is a true adventurer. His comrades in the Social Democratic Party, Menshevik, used to say of him. Trotsky brings to every meeting his own chair. Today he sits with this party, tomorrow he sits with another. For the moment he places his chair in the Communist Party. Well, for an adventurer seeking a career this is not ill-advised. The Bolsheviki will probably give him all he longs for.